So this part of the session is now going to be, we're going to be hearing from our keynote speak, speaker in just a moment. And here um, from BC Children's Hospital Research Institute to introduce our keynote speaker and to welcome you um, is uh, Dr. Quinn Doan. So Dr. Doan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for the warm welcome, Lisa. On behalf of the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute, I would like to welcome everyone to the 2020 Discovery Days in Health Sciences. I would like to acknowledge that we're speaking to you from the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Furthermore, this acknowledgement, gratitude, and respect extends to all the First Nations communities from which you may be joining us today. Today, we have almost 200 participants from 53 schools across the Lower Mainland joining us for this virtual event. While the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all areas of healthcare, we're grateful to you and to all our volunteers who have found new and creative ways we can continue to connect during this challenging time. Today, you will have the opportunity to explore a variety of career options in medicine and to virtually meet researchers, clinicians, and educators. It's valuable real world experience that we hope turns into a lifelong passion for health, medicine and research. Something shared by every one of our researchers and trainees here at the Research Institute. Our vision is to passionately pursue discovery, knowing our achievements have the capacity to transform lives. We hope that you'll leave today inspired to do the same. Now I'd like to introduce someone who truly does transform lives. Dr. Srinivas Murthy is a critical care specialist who is also trained in infectious diseases and is an investigator at the BC Children's Hospital. He is leading new top-notch quality research on COVID-19 treatment to help Canadians and people around the world. Dr. Murphy, the principal investigator of the Canadian Treatments for COVID-19 trial, which will evaluate different treatments such as antiretroviral drugs and antimalarial drugs for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. This trial is part of a multinational initiative called the Solidarity Trial, which is being coordinated by the World Health Organization and is supported by the Canadian Institute of Health Research in an unprecedented level of global collaboration. Dr. Murthy studies severe infections and how to manage critically ill patients. He's also a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Murthy. Thank you, Quinn. Um, thank you, everyone. And hi, and good morning to everybody. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next 25 minutes or so um, is sort of answer your questions about COVID-19, public health research and careers at the front line. As Quinn mentioned, I work in the ICU here at Children's. And a lot of my research um, is focused on COVID-19, at least over the past 11 months now, it seems, although it seems like it's been much, much longer than that, but also much, much shorter than that as well at the same time in a very odd way. Um, and also from a, a public health perspective, because I am working with the, the province and the federal government about sort of the public health approach um, to COVID-19 and how to best navigate things. And so, um, I, I believe who has control of my, Lisa, you have control of my slides, correct? Okay, so I'll say next slide. So next slide, we'll go through like what I do every day, sort of just to give an overview of a career, so to speak. Next. And then a uh, brief how I got to do it. Because um, I think I was asked to speak to you guys who are sort of thinking about careers and thinking about where to go from here. And I think like this global crisis um, can crystallize a lot of thoughts as to how we can move forward globally um, and answer questions and help people in a coordinated and collaborative way while still like having a great job that keeps you interested and exciting and all that stuff. Next, and then why I do it at the end. Um, just basic what sort of motivates um, anyone or me specifically to to do a career and to get to a place where you can do the thing that you that you truly like doing. Um, so let's start with what I do every day. Next. So sadly, or happily, I guess, 
Uh, over the past few months, most of my days, many of my days, and many of many of our days has been like this. This is a, a screenshot from a, a Zoom meeting. I stole it from Google Images or something like that, so I don't know anyone on the meeting itself. But I think many of us have adapted to appreciate that our current life and our current way of doing work is we're like spending lots of time talking to your computer. Um, and so like, while people may think that I have this, this glamorous, um, um, completely interesting at all times job, it is, but a lot of it is spent talking on Zoom, uh, which is great because you're talking to exciting people who you're collaborating with and you're working together to solve problems that have direct impact. Uh, but in the end, a lot of it nowadays is on Zoom or on telephone calls. Next. Um, so what we're working on is this. Um, I think this is from a week or so before when I made these slides, is trying to reduce the number of COVID-19 cases in British Columbia. We all watch these numbers. We listen to Dr. Henry here in British Columbia every day as she reports the numbers and describes what we can do and what we can do better to help stop this outbreak. Um, and that's the reason we're all doing this by accelerants right now, rather than being in person, is purely because of this chart. We want this chart to not be there, so those numbers are flat, so that we can go back to having these conversations in person and learning from each other in person, and I'm helping to sort of get us to that place. Obviously, it's a complex problem, and a complex problem has complex solutions requiring lots of different types of answers. Next slide. What I'm mostly concerned about, not mostly, but also partially concerned about is sort of the world. So Canada is there at the, at the bottom, um, not at the very bottom. We're not um, Japan or Australia or Taiwan, but we're not at the top. Um, there's United States, United Kingdom, Germany. And so what I look at is both how we can do things better here in Canada. And while we think that we are very severely affected because of the impact it's having on our lives, if you look globally at the impact this outbreak is having on various parts of the world, Canada has been reasonably spared. Not in terms of the impact on your like day to day life, because everyone is basically spending time at home, but on the actual impact on health outcomes, namely numbers of deaths and strain on a health system. So I think we need to feel lucky, but also share that luck and share those lessons with the rest of the world and how we can sort of um, learn from others, but mostly how others can learn from us. Next. Uh, and also sort of the highlights, like, well, this, this is the total number of deaths in the world right now, and where they are happening and where they are happening since the beginning of the outbreak. And so if you see a tiny, tiny little gray sliver in the middle, above the US dark gray sliver, that is the Canada and rest of North America, namely Caribbean sliver. It's small compared to Europe, compared to the US, compared to India, compared to Latin America. And so in terms of numbers of deaths, we're doing okay. In terms of being able to share the knowledge and our lessons with the world, we need to improve um, because this is truly a global problem that requires global solutions. Next. So what, I'm work what am I working on? What am I doing most of my time? And so, Really, what we're working on is working on these three sort of big buckets of managing this outbreak. Prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And prevention is the stuff that we're all doing right now. We're staying at home. Um, we're distancing, we're wearing masks in the grocery store, we're wearing masks in various public spots, and we're waiting for that vaccine, which very exciting news over these past couple of days on that front. We're working on diagnostics. We're working on being able to better know when any one person has this disease. And of course, what I'm specifically working on is working on treatment, trying to figure out if you do get this disease, 
how can we make it better? Namely, how can we prevent you from having long-term problems? And how can we prevent you from, unfortunately, considering, considering the burden of disease, dying? Next slide. So if you think back and think about how we're going to get out of this, like how are we going to get out of this pandemic? And I think looking forward, obviously we want to decrease the incidence of this disease. And that is from maybe some prophylactic medication that you can take after exposure, but that's probably not going to work. Um, but we're mostly looking towards immunity. And that is from our vaccine. And that is going to come in the near to short term. Um, but in the absence of that vaccine, we have to think about other ways that we're going to get out of this, and specifically looking at decreasing severity of disease. Other SARS outbreaks have had mutations, like the SARS-CoV-1, for example, that have sort of let it to sort of peer out as the years went by. That's unlikely to happen this time around. Variolation, which is the sort of theory that we're wearing a mask now, so the amount of virus that we get when we get infected is less, also unlikely to be a major driver. So decreasing severity of disease is super important, and that's primarily going to be driven by better care. So that combination of better care if you get the disease and preventing the disease through immunity, through vaccines, is what we're all waiting for fundamentally right now and what we're all working towards. Next. Um, so when you work, think about how this disease um, affects people who are infected and how we're we going to decrease the severity by providing better care. We, in the sort of treatment world, sort of divide up after you get the virus into two phases. The first is when the virus just gets you. Namely, this is the viral response phase. You don't really feel that many symptoms at this point. And a lot of times people will not feel any symptoms at all. And then as the virus sort of exerts its effects in some people, and we don't know exactly who those people are, start to get inflammation or their body reacting against the virus existing in their body. And that reaction causes a lot of the symptoms that people feel. Initially fevers and coughs and other things that are typically mild, but in some severe cases, and thankfully it's a minority of the cases, more severe disease that requires hospitalization or critical care. And so if we can target our treatments at those phases, namely, do we want to look at the virus and give medications that affect the virus, or do we want to give medications that affect the inflammatory response, or do we want to give both? Um, all of these questions we're wrestling with right now in the treatment world, and we've solved a few things, but we remain sort of um, solving a few more other things. Next. So back to that. And so like, you can give medications to people if they have the disease that sort of treat, treat the patient, um, namely treat their host inflammatory response. And you probably have heard, or if you've known anyone who's gotten COVID and has been in a hospital, they probably wouldn't have, would have gotten a medication called steroids, something that's super common and everyone uses for a variety of different conditions. And that's mostly to treat that inflammatory response. And it's mostly for people who get admitted to the hospital and are more severely ill. Unfortunately, we don't really have good medications that make a big difference on treating the virus. Namely, once you get infected, can you take something that blocks the virus from doing its thing and triggering that host or human inflammatory response? We don't have one yet. And so we're looking really hard and trying to figure out whether or not a lot of different medications can do that so that we can block um, people from needing um, oxygen and needing critical care and, and so on. Um, and that's where a lot of our activities and energies are focused on right now. Next. So if you think about what we're trying to do more broadly and sort of stepping backwards. Um, so the top part of that is what we do now. And so our current response to severe outbreaks, you have a big spike of infections and your public health response goes and your preclinical research response, which is scientists in a lab 
trying to figure out whether this virus can do this or that, and then generating medications to that. And then at the end, a clinical research response, namely to like actually treat the patients and learn from the patients you are treating. Unfortunately, with SARS-1 and H1N1 and, all of, and Ebola, all of the other major outbreaks, that clinical research response has been too late. Um, we haven't been able to learn what makes patients better during the actual outbreak. The public health response was too good. Unfortunately, lots of patients lost their lives during that initial spike. The goal, and sort of what we're doing in this outbreak, is the B figure there, where the research, which actually improves the care, is directly linked to the public health response. And so we're learning while we're doing. And with that, with research, we can sort of improve how patients do just by flattening that curve. So if you get sick, you're less likely to die because of the research that's been done. It's obviously super tricky to do and requires a lot of coordination um, to move that curve to the left, that research curve. But if you want to flatten it, um, it's super important. Um, it requires a lot of logistics, a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of uh, um, being able to navigate different uh, Um, competing interests, but the importance cannot really be overstated. Next. Next. Oh, there you go. Oh, sorry, that back, sorry. So this is where we are in British Columbia. Um, as everyone knows, as everyone sort of is tracking, um, it's, it's going up. Ideally, um, we'd start to see a flattening. And I think everyone on this call, I pray and hope, is doing their part to minimize transmission as much as possible. Um, and I also work at the public health interface as well to self help sort of sell some of these messages across the province to sort of think about how we can um, flatten that curve, both from a research perspective and from a, a public health perspective. What interventions um, do people listen to, to help um, navigate the confusing messaging that's out there and to help move um, that needle downwards? Um, so I think everyone on this call and all of you are probably looking at these numbers all the time. Anyway, next slide. So my job, and so like I started with this, what I do every day was a lot of that stuff. A lot of just like research design and research questions and interfacing with lots of different places in the country and the world. Some days, and I do work in the ICU, I was in the ICU just yesterday, um, is taking care of critically ill patients and making sure that they get the best possible care. Um, and so that involves managing a team and doing procedures on those patients who need them, and then making sure that children um, get discharged from hospital as good a condition as possible. Next. Other days, and most days now, is me sort of furiously typing um, either emails or documents or papers or anything of the sort. Um, while um, a lot of research is spent on sharing ideas with colleagues and with people around the world, and how we share ideas is primarily with words. And so a lot of my day is spent in front of a computer. I'm currently working from home today, as you can probably tell by my hoodie, um, and typing and making sure that uh, messages are clear and the public can respond in a coherent way. Next. Some days I go back to the ICU. I go back to the ICU tomorrow. Next slide. And other days I spend more time on a phone and talking to people about these issues. And so lots of typing and lots of phone calls. Uh, and next, all intermixed with uh, lots of Zoom calls. Uh, and so that is my sort of overview of what I do most days. Next. But I think I was asked to speak about how I got to do it. Um, and I'll go into this for the next few minutes. Next. So I'm from Newfoundland originally, so from a small town outside of St. John's. Lisa's congratulating me on that. Uh, 
And so this is not my, it's not a picture of my house. I did not live on such a scenic um, part of the country of Newfoundland. I lived in more of a less scenic part of Newfoundland, but Newfoundland's gorgeous. I recommend anyone once we're able to travel there, um, to travel there, it's lovely. Um, and so I went to university there, a high school and university there, and then left to the mainland afterwards. And it's since then sort of been traveling around to different institutions around North America and the world, getting different parts of training um, optimized and have landed here in Vancouver for the past um, five or six years now. And so next, I think what's brought me here and where I got to where I am, and I apologize for the cheesy picture, um, but I think I want to bring up the theme of the people around me who sort of have driven me and driven people around me collectively to achieve sort of exciting things. Um, and I think the people I met in high school, the people I met in university, the people I met in primarily med school, um, and that sort of um, team approach where we all sort of drove each other to do interesting and different things um, is what really has sort of pushed me to um, want to do this type of work. And I don't want to underestimate the power of, like, not that peer pressure is necessarily a good thing all the time, but in some ways it's that peer network that you create around you and you start to create around you at a very early age that can push you to achieve things that are exciting and great. I think like obviously it's great to have mentors and people above you who sort of can provide you a pathway as to, oh, I want to be like that person at some point. Um, how did you get there? But I think it's also equally and probably more important to sort of chart your own course as young people um, with the young people around you thinking that, oh, this is the way I want to see the world around me and this is how I want to sort of elicit change. Let's all do this together. And you create this like-minded group of people. Um, and I can speak from my experience and sort of my colleagues from med school where we all sort of decided that, yeah, we, we all wanted to do different things in medicine, but we all sort of had the same principles in mind, namely we want to help we want to make sure that justice and other ideas like that are fundamental in our practice. And we want to make sure that everyone is equitably cared for and has equitable access to the important things that health can offer. And I think like, I have friends who are surgeons, I have friends who are public health docs, I have friends who are family docs, and we're all very close still and we all very much share ideas all the time. And they have sort of driven me to do this, and I have driven them to do similar things in their scope of practice. And I think that network that you create around yourself, which is both fun and exciting, and sort of you see each other at weddings and see their, your kids are friends and um, all of that stuff um, is great personally, but it's also great professionally as well. And I think that network is, is hugely important for me at least. Next. Uh, and so how I got here is, is, is that being pushed. Um, and so like I remember in, in medical school, like I didn't, I was kind of just doing the usual things. And then a friend of mine, like, let's go to this place in the world that none of us have been to, just take two months off med school and just travel around with uh, just our backpacks. And it was a part of the world that I had never been to and really I didn't really have inf any infrastructure. We just went and picked up and decided to go on adventures together. And I think those sort of things that push you beyond what you are comfortable with are what sort of shape your future in a way and shape your agendas both personally and professionally. And having those intermix and having you be constantly nervous about the next decision you are making um, is an exciting way to live. Obviously, it's stressful, but that high risk often leads to high reward. Um, and that is an exciting way of living, obviously, and I'm comfortable enough to have that ability to risk things. Um, and not everyone has that comfort or luxury. And I think getting that um, access available to lots of people is, is important. Next, I'm looking at the clock, so I'm just going to zip through. So why I do it? Uh, okay, why I do it? Next. 
somebody's, I think like clinical medicine is fine. Um, taking care of patients, particularly critically unwell patients is a huge responsibility, it's a huge honor. Um, and I take that very seriously. And I think um, it's something that I cherish and pride and it's something that I, I, I truly, truly enjoy. Other days, next. I think every day it's sort of that collaboration, not the same network of people that I've always talked to, but people I work with every day, I enjoy working with them. People I collaborate with around the world, I enjoy collaborating with them. And so I think that why I do it is to sort of build that network and sort of have fun with people that I really trust and collaborate with well and have sort of similar principles as to how we want to solve problems. Obviously that's not always the case and it's a complex political world out there and you can't always make decisions in a vacuum with people who think exactly like you, but it's always nice to have sort of some fun times during your meetings and during your work days to make sure that you both enjoy what you do and enjoy what you're doing it with or who you're doing it with. Next. Um, I like learning. And so every day is like, there's a lot of reading, especially now over these past 11 months with COVID. Like literally, I think I read 10 to 20 papers a day that are coming at a fire hose into my inbox. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. And being able to distinguish between the two is, is fun. And so every day is this constant knowledge um, um, fire hose, as I say. And so trying to sort that out is, is great. And that constant like, joy of learning new things about the world around us um, is great. Next. Um, and also just talking to people, like not talking to my collaborators or people I work with, but just with the general public. Like I tend to do a lot of talking to media or talking to like policymakers or talking to public in general about say coronavirus response or the research that we do and so on. And just hearing from people and hearing their opinions and hearing what they are struggling with and hearing what they're not struggling with. I think that's so important and so exciting. And so it, it's a big world out there and there's so many different and cool opinions about how to do things. And I think sharing those opinions in a constructive way is a super fun part of my job. Next. Um, so this is where we are. Um, this is an unfortunate chart, um, but I think we can solve this. I think collectively, this is a problem that um, is, requires collective action. And yes, a vaccine will come, and then it will come in the next few months, likely. But it's, I think it's important to recognize that that vaccine needs to be sort of distributed to all of those places to make sure that we solve this collectively. Um, and not just one at a time. Next. Thank you. That's all I got. I think I ended five minutes early. So I, 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 I think. That was terrific. In fact, there are several. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy. I, uh, I love your sense of humor. I love the small detection of maybe a Newfoundland accent when you say hearing. <laughs> And uh, we have a few questions. We probably, I'm sorry, so sorry, students. We won't have time to answer them all. But um, I do want to go to one or two. Something that, the, the first question that was put in there, uh, I'm on the Q&A. If you click the Q&A portion, portion, Dr. Murphy, on the top right, you'll see them too. There may be one you prefer to answer. Um, what do you think caused the contrast in numbers? Um, for example, United States versus Japan versus Canada. What, why is that graph so different? Why, why is it lower for some countries than others? I think that's literally the, the trillion dollar question at this point. Um, I think there's a lot of public policy that goes into how individuals react to governments and their relationship with governments and the quality of governments. Um, and I think that is probably one of the main features as to how some countries have done better than others. I don't think there's any biologic difference. I don't think there's any viral based difference. There's probably not that much difference in the care provided once patients get sick um, and in a hospital. I think it's a lot of prevention, mm. um, namely how different places have responded to the available evidence and disseminated it across their population. You see places like the United States, which is having a great deal of difficulty communicating science and implementing science at the level of individuals. And then you see places like Taiwan, um, which has sort of a central health system that can fairly quickly um, roll out an intervention across its 
um, small geography. And obviously there are very different places with very different geographies and very different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of those things impact. So I can't say there's one specific thing because there obviously if there was one thing, everyone would be doing it. Um, I think it's a reflection of how complicated the world is and how important um, collective and community-based organizations are to solve these problems rather than one person by themselves. Yeah, thank you for that. That I actually, I think, touched upon many different parts of some of the other questions that we're seeing there. Um, just to reinforce a common message we're hearing, one of the students has asked, how effective is social distancing in mitigating infection? Um, and what are your thoughts on that in terms of lockdown? Like, if you look at the trajectory of that curve that we saw back in March. We saw a rapid increase here in British Columbia and a fairly rapid decrease. And the only thing that was done was social or physical distancing. This was even before really widespread mask use was in place. This was primarily staying at home, um, not going out unless you absolutely needed to. And effectively now we're in the same place in most of Canada as we were back in March and April in terms of our health system. And so similar perspectives on keeping ourselves distant. Um, so that works. And I think, I think it's fairly good consensus that we know how to solve this problem. It's just a matter of solving it, namely implementing the things and, this, and the trade-offs that go into implementing those things. And there are trade-offs, obviously, because um, staying at home for weeks on end, everybody is impossible. Um, and I see a question about schools, um, and that's obviously a hot topic, and keeping schools open as much as possible um, is super important from a variety of different perspectives, primarily from the child's well-being perspective. Um, yeah. And I think trying to balance all of those things is um, a policy maker's nightmare. Um, and it's, it's hard. And I think we're all trying our best. Well, we're grateful to you. Thank you so much for this talk. We're grateful to you and the, all the work you're doing because, you know, I feel like there's just never been a greater focus ever on that than there is now on public health. It's that silent preventer. Public health does so much preventing, uh, prevention all the time. And only now are we really aware of uh, how powerful that is. So thank you so much for being part of our talk.